Okay, moving on. Ultimate beneficial ownership. There are two distinctive types of beneficial owners. Those with ownership and those with control. An owner is an individual who directly or indirectly owns 25% or more of the equity interests of a legal person. A controlling person is a non-owner or owner with less than 25% ownership who exercises management and operational control of the legal person. This is often called the control prong. Sometimes there are layers of legal entities in this structure, however all legal persons ultimately track back down to a natural person or persons. So that's the most important thing here. All legal persons ultimately track down to a natural person or persons. These natural persons are the ultimate beneficial owners. Some jurisdictions expect ultimate beneficial owners holding more than 10% or more to be identified. I'm seeing this a lot more actually these days. It is important you know your organ institution's policy on the threshold for identifying ultimate beneficial ownership, which could be as low as 10%. Uh, look, it's usually about 25. If it goes moderate or EDD, it might be 10%, but it's moving towards 10%. Ultimate beneficial owners are the people who benefit from the activities of a legal person or a group of legal persons. The vast majority of UBOs are legitimate, but bad actors will try to hide behind complex structures to disguise their criminal activities and perpetrate financial crime. In the US, if an ultimate beneficial owner cannot be found, then the control prong must sign off. Um, where is it? In the US, it must sign a certification form stating that there is no person that owns at least 25%. The European Union adopts a similar approach. If all persons possible means of discovering the ultimate beneficial owner have been exhausted, then the natural person or persons holding the position of senior managing officials are considered to be the ultimate beneficial owner or owners. The control prong element must be known, but where it proves impossible to identify the UBO's or red flag raised, must, you must ask yourself why a UBO might want to hide in this way, and you must be confident that your controllers are properly identified and are not colluding in financial crime. Beneficial ownership, how to calculate a complex aggregate. Okay, so if we go in here, this will sort of explain how to calculate it. This is pretty important how to learn. So we'll go through it. When calculating the beneficial ownership, it is important to look across the whole corporate aggregate structure. In this example, Ace Corporation is owned by three companies, Diamond LLC, Ruby Holdings, and Pearl Properties. However, when the calculations are made, you can see that David owns 15% of Ace Corp, Dan owns 10% of Ace Corp, Randy owns 22.5% of Ace Corp, Philip owns 27.5% of Ace Corp, and Pat owns 20% of Ace Corp. Here is how we got to that calculation. According to the chart, David and Dan each own 50% of Diamond, 50% ownership of Diamond multiplied by 30% ownership of Ace equals 15% to Ace. Ruby is owned 50% by Emerald and 50% by Topaz, 50% ownership in Ruby multiplied by, 30 by Ruby's 30% ownership in Ace equals 15%. Emerald and Topaz each own 50% of Ace. Pearl is owned 50% by Ghana and 50% by Onyx. 50% ownership of Pearl multiplied by Pearl's 40% ownership of Ace equals 20% ownership each of Ace. Emerald is owned by Randy, though Emerald Randy owns 50% of Ruby. Ruby owns 30% of Ace, and 50% and 30% of Randy owns 50% of Ace. Randy and Philip each own um, each of 50% of Topaz. That means Randy and Philip each own 25% of Ruby. Ruby owns 30% of Ace, and 25% of 30% equals 7.5%. Randy and Philip each own Jesus, each own 75% of Ace. Randy owns Emerald 50% ownership of Ace from Emerald and 7.5% ownership of Ace from Topaz equals 22.5% ownership of Ace. Philip also owns 100% of Garnet, which owns 100% 50% of Pearl. Pearl owns 40% of Ace, 50% 40% equals 20%. Philip owns 20% of Ace. Philip owns 20% of Ace for his ownership in Garnet. Philip also owns 7.5% of Ace through his ownership in Topaz. 20% plus 7.5 equals 27.5. Philip is the UBO. Pat owns 100% of Onyx. Onyx owns 50% of Pearl. Pearl owns 40% of Ace. 50% of 40% equals 20%. Pat owns 20% of Ace. Explore. Introduction to the Explore step. The Explore step. Reminder. Now that you've determined what you already know about the customer, you need to explore further. This is the second step in a four-step research model. For higher-risk customers, you need to identify the source of wealth, conduct name screening against sanctions lists, determine if your customer is a PEP, and look for negative news. Identifying a source of wealth. Okay, identifying the source of wealth is a key component of due of customer due diligence. Source of wealth can be very straightforward, such as a customer who just inherited wealth from a deceased relative. For other types of customers, such as a publicly exposed person or a pep, 
it is more difficult to identify a source of wealth. The Wolfsburg Group, an association of global banks which aims to develop frameworks and guidance for the management of financial crime risk, states that financial institutions only accept clients whom source of wealth can be reasonably established as legitimate. In addition, the Wolfsburg Group principles highlight the need to identify, identi identify the beneficial owner of funds from all accounts. This is particularly true when dealing with money managers and similar intermediaries. In this important, it is important to determine that the intermediary have a satisfactory due diligence process for their clients or a regulatory obligation to conduct such due diligence. In private banking, principals have recommended that at least one person other than the private banker should approve all new clients and accounts. PIPs may have positions of substantial authority, but you have control over government-owned resources. You must be satisfied that funds flowing through their account are legitimate. This could include verifying any accumulated fortune and that how that was acquired. Check records to see what an official is paid. For example, in the UK, a member of parliament is paid a set salary. After they leave office, high-ranking PIPs may go down to become senior advisors, board directors, public speakers, or authors. All of these roles can be checked and verified. People living in, living in or deriving funds from high-risk countries for financial crime should be asked to provide uh, evidence of how they obtain their wealth. Customers involved in types of economic and business or business activities or sectors known as susceptible to money laundering, such as cash-intensive businesses, should be asked to act for activity forecasts and properly ordered accounts. Okay, uh, the next part is name screening. Uh, a lot of people, banks do require to do name screening, but having said that, this is kind of changing a bit. So. You know, a lot of companies are just are just doing this now, essentially. So, um, here we go. When conducting an internet search, some of the searches returned will be false positives. The matches returned, oh sorry, internet search false positives. The matches returned will show the records against which there were matches and the likelihood, based on the information entered, that, the, that this is a target match. In other words, the likelihood that your customer is the same person as the record. In many cases, a search of common names, for example, John Smith, will return multiple matches. It is then your responsibility to determine whether or not the customer's search result is correct or false based on other facts you know about the customer. As sophisticated as the search tools and phrases you might use might be, they will ultimately require human analysis to resolve the matches. Most hit returned by the system will be false positives, meaning that the customer and the person on record are not the same person. Even so, you must document the false positives and note why there were no m not matches, especially if the reason might not be obvious for some future reader. Some of the most difficult false positives to report are matches for common names. To decide whether or not you have the right match, you might have you might have to match the result against other things. You know about your customers, such as date of birth, nationality, occupation, or address. Other challenges are posed by foreign language, for example, Arabic naming conventions along the transition translation. In this case, the spelling of Arabic word and other, and other alphabet poses a challenge. The same Arabic word can be spelled many different ways, but when it is typed into a computer using a Latin alphabet, for example, the terrorist Osama bin Laden had a hundred aliases names. Most of them were based on spelling variations when the writing Arabic name in Latin. Automatic translation services might also give a false positive for negative news, the context of which might not have been altered in translation. All right, name match, mistaken identity case example. Two companies, Beaufort Group and Beaufort Securities, were entirely unrelated entities. Beaufort, Beaufort Group was in the UK and Beaufort Securities was based in the US. Both firms were active in wealth management and both were known by, to the UK Conduct Authority as they were active in the UK. Things went wrong for the legitimate Beaufort Group the day the US Department of Justice announced it was conducting an investigation to Beaufort Securities in relation to trading in the stock of a number of US companies and international money laundering. The Financial Conduct Authority of the FC was known in assisting the US Department of Justice. Beaufort Group was promptly swamped with inquiries from anxious clients to the point where its website crashed. One of the main reasons Beaufort Group website crashed was that customers assumed Beaufort Securities was part of Beaufort Group. This was compounded by the fact that the two companies' logos were very similar and the branding, colour and font were also very close. The situation escalated when Beaufort Securities was placed into administration by the FCA before the US Department of Justice announced an indictment on the same day. The case had all the ingredients to draw in readers including attempted sale of a Picasso painting un to an undercover FBI agent in the money laundering sting. The Beaufort Group website subsequently went down again, clients phoned in constantly, and Beaufort Group believe it lost business potential customers were frightened off. Beaufort Group quickly put up a pop-up box on its website which told business that it was completely unrelated business. This case is an example of the impact of verifying that you have checked the right identity when performing customer due diligence. Look for any warning pop-up boxes, check the correct legal names and perform other searches on the website. 
such as the names of the directors. Does the information match information that was provided by your customer, as it is possible that both its securities were set up with criminal intent? It is also possible that it matched its website with the legitimate Beaufort Group website to deliberately mislead any unwary viewers. Okay, interesting.